Kate, thank you for the privilege uh, to be here. Uh, I originally come from the state of Florida, so I have to say I'm much happier coming here in May uh, than I am in December or January. <laughs> Although uh, my friend Odin, uh, Odin Johansson uh, lured me here for a cold response exercise a few years ago, the appropriately named cold response. And uh, it was the first time I had ever been on a, a naval a warship that was underway, and it was a Norwegian frigate as part of the exercise. It was very impressive. But also, I asked Odin, uh, we were getting ready to speak to some cadets at the military academy, and I said, Odin, what, what's the strategic, what do you worry about? And he said, Ben, I worry about the part of the map that never shows up on any map of NATO, that top 10% that always gets cut off because you try to make the whole thing, you know, Turkey and everything fit, so the very top sliver of Norway and Svalbard always get cut off on the map. He said, that's what we worry about. And I said, why is that? And he said, because if the Russians ever captured that part, then it would completely change the whole dynamic for the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap. So it was an eye-opening um, experience for me to, to get that awareness. And of course, General uh, Sarverson talked about the map. And then in Sweden, um, uh, Carl Engelbrechtsen, he took me to Gotland Island just after they had begun to put troops back, back on Gotland Island. That got my attention. So here's Sweden also, Sweden, the home of ABBA, thinking if the Russians, if the Russians got Gotland Island, again, it would change the strategic geometry of the region. And then I went to an exercise with uh, Seppo Toivon and the former chief of the Finnish army and watched one of their rapid mobilization exercises. And I was so impressed how quickly Finland can put armed troops in the field tens of thousands in just days. So what, what I'm saying, and also uh, Runa Jakobsen that also took me on a tour. I'm embarrassed to say this. I had forgotten or maybe never realized that Norway actually shares a, a border with Russia. And, and you're all saying, oh, of course, hello. Um, but if you're not here, if you don't think about it, it's not so obvious. And so Runa took me out on a tour of some of the, the guard posts along that border and see the young women and men of Norway, Norway's armed forces out there every day. So my point is that this region um, is my North Star to, to guide me of how I think strategically about Russia, that you take it so seriously and that you do the necessary preparations without great fanfare. So let me talk about just three or four sort of themes here in my allotted time, and I'm grateful for this. First of all, Ukraine. We know, that, we know from history that war is a test of will, and it's a test of logistics. We know that Ukraine has the greater will, and I believe that each day the logistical imbalance moves in favor of Ukraine. It's not perfect. We have a long way to go. But the Ukrainian situation gets a little bit better every day as more and more nations contribute and as their network matures. Russia has no, there is no Ramstein for Russia. There are no allies providing things to them. And their situation gets a little bit worse every day. I believe that Russia is going to culminate, you know, Clausewitz's uh, construct of the culmination point when the attack loses all impetus because of enemy action, lost leaders, logistics, lost will. I believe they're going to culminate by the end of August and that Ukraine will have the potential to go over to the offense and drive Russia back to the 23 February line. Now, we'll know in about three months whether I'm an idiot or had pretty good analysis or somewhere in between. Uh, and it'll be, it'll be obvious for everybody to see. This is what I think is going to happen. Uh, when Secretary Austin said, we're going to help Ukraine win, that was huge. 20 years in Iraq and Afghanistan, I never heard any American official say, we're going to win. This means so much to a soldier when you're told, we're going to win. We're going to get everything. We're going to win. That, that's, that's not just a bumper sticker. And, and uh, Secretary Austin was my commander for, uh, back uh, a few years ago. He, he chooses words very carefully. He didn't, the off the cuff is not part of his persona. So that was a clear policy statement for the United States. We're going to help Ukraine win, and we're going to weaken Russia so that they cannot threaten their neighbors anymore. 
Those are powerful statements. Not everybody's comfortable with that. But that's, this, this is what we're talking about. And I would welcome challenges maybe later um, during our discussion. Now, of course, I live in Frankfurt, and my friends always say, yeah, but what, what will Putin do? I mean, if he's in a corner, he's, it's going to go nuclear. I don't think so. I take it serious. He has thousands of nuclear weapons. But I think it's very unlikely that he would use a nuclear weapon. There's no advantage. There's no reason to do it other than to uh, perhaps break apart our unity, which means those nuclear weapons are only useful if he doesn't use them. Once he uses it, then everything is different. It will be impossible for the United States not to get in, other UK not to get in. It will be impossible. And then you can be sure that there will be a devastating response, probably not a nuclear response. So this is not automatically a nuclear escalation. In fact, this is what the F-35 was designed for. About five days, kinetic strikes, all of Russia's land forces inside Ukraine, gone. Black Sea Fleet, gone. And that will be communicated to the Kremlin. That's what I think the, res the response will be and should be. So, Francois Heisberg gave us good counsel yesterday. Don't be too fast to draw conclusions from what's happened. But um, what, can, what lessons can we draw or, or, um, that impact our future? Number one, logistics. Ammunition consumption in the last three months exceeded what we used for artillery in the last 20 years. I mean, incredible amounts of ammunition. None of us, including the United States, has enough ammunition. And it's very expensive. No politician wants to spend money on things that you hope will sit in a bunker forever. So this is part of deterrence. Air defense, air and missile defense, and certainly the addition of Sweden and Finland will be uh, hugely important for, for air and missile defense in the region. The big difference is that we now know, or it's been confirmed, that Russia will use precision weapons to hit apartment buildings, hospitals, uh, theaters. So in other words, the requirement for missile defense now goes beyond critical infrastructure and military. It now includes all of our population centers because that's the threat. So the requirement for whatever system you use has gone up a lot, significantly. Readiness. We are seeing firsthand uh, what unprepared soldiers look like these Russian forces. The reason the Russian Air Force has not achieved air superiority, which is the first priority for all air forces, is to get air superiority, yet with all their numbers, they have not been able to do that. Why is that? <laughs> They're not trained. Any pilot uh, can take off and land, but can you fly in a contested airspace? Do you have operational design so that you're supporting ground forces? They don't do that. So most of the precision mission munitions that the Air Force launches are actually from inside Russian airspace because they don't dare go into Ukrainian airspace. So the importance of spending money on training for our pilots, for our sailors, for our soldiers is manifest. Again, this is hard to explain to political leaders sometimes. How do you define readiness and why we spend so much money on exercises? It's so that they can be successful and so that they can survive. Intelligence sharing. The best intelligence briefing I ever received from an Estonian was from an Estonian intelligence officer. It was shortly after the invasion of Crimea. And I was blown away. I said, how did you get all this? Again, I was naive. And he looked at me, well, sir, we live here. And, and we, we speak the language. We, we know all these guys. And I was like, okay, but, but wait a minute. You're not five eyes. You don't have skies full of satellites. And that's when the light came on for me that um, if we are going to be successful at, at deterring or defeating Russian forces, we have to have speed of recognition of what's happening, particularly in a hybrid environment, which means we have got to knock down the walls of, uh, that prevent us from sharing intelligence at the speed we need to. In my last 30 seconds, let me say this. Um, Sweden and Finland coming to our alliance is going to make us so better. So much better. Two great liberal democratic countries, two strong resilient societies, two members of the European Union, as Anna Wieslander reminded us yesterday, that there's added benefit there. And then, of course, two very capable, modernizing, rapidly expandable 
militaries. I'm confident that our Turkish ally is going to eventually come around and support this and that we are all going to be much safer. Kate, thank you very much.